get this, they didn't even have a, a steering wheel for the front tire. Whatever you want to say. How are you going to steer it? Um, and some, some planes steer using their engines thrust on one side and the other. Um, but this MiG had a braking system that used compressed air, and it did not have an air compressor in the vehicle. They actually had a, an air tank that they pumped up with air uh, when the plane was ready to go. They'd pump that up with air, and you would apply the brakes on one wheel or the other on the back to turn that way. You break the back wheel on the right, it'll swing around pivoting on that wheel. And once your air's gone, your brakes are gone. It was just compressed air brake system. And that's how you steer. They had uh, instrumentation that required constant attention. That was one of the distractions the American pli pilots fly in the thing. They said you constantly have to pay attention to your, to your uh, equipment. A lot of the instrumentation was redesigned, slightly updated stuff from World War II from airplanes America had given them. So we saw in a lot of their technology, we saw uh, like a reincarnation of better workmanship, newer, I mean, you know, they had five or six or seven years to work on this stuff. Um, but it was our technology, and we knew some of the inherent flaws, for example, in their radar system and stuff. So after looking much more deeply into this situation, I found out that the MiG fighter jet goes, it starts going out of control at higher speeds. When you get, uh, it's able to climb a couple thousand feet higher than the American jets are, better engine. It's able to climb faster than the American jets are, better engine. That's about it. The control and stability of the thing, it started, the lateral control started getting real shaky. There was not enough surface on the back, uh, back, I don't, I don't know the terminology of their things, but on the wing at the back tail thing, there wasn't enough surface area for that technically. There were all kinds of problems. Uh, and the one thing that this plane had going for it was its engine. Uh, in fact, the cannons that the thing carried could fire for six seconds. Six straight seconds of fire compared to 14 seconds for the Americans. So we had more of a chance to, to get them. But they had much heavier, bigger guns. And they would just hit us with one or two or three of the bullets and it would take our plane down. And those MiGs, uh, we had to really hit them hard to get them to go down with our smaller guns. And here's something that the military said. They said they flew the plane multiple times a day, days on end. They said they did many, many flights. And after a whole month, the sum total of all of their uh, uh, flying, the sum total of the maintenance on the craft was to replace the braking system the wheels and some minor electrical problem in the panel. And that was the sum total of maintenance for a month. Now, I heard someone mention, say a military Air Force officer say, uh, in the late 80s, late 1980s, flying a more modern MiG. He said, said flying a, uh, a, an American F-14 or F-16 is like flying a Swiss watch. Absolutely perfect. Um, fine detail, workmanship and everything. Flying a MiG is like flying a tank. That was his comparison. So, uh, tough as heck. Don't need a lot of uh, maintenance and supervision on the thing. You can see why. They're not very good at maintaining stuff in Russia. They better have stuff you don't have to work much on. They found that the cockpit temperature would be as high as, as uh, 80 or 90 or 100 or 110 or 120 degrees until you got up higher in the atmosphere and then it could drop down below freezing. Huge, huge range of operation. Now it, it just took like seven minutes for a MiG to climb to 40,000 feet where it took us about 12 minutes for one of ours and we couldn't get as high as that. I think the MiG could go to 52 and we could go to like 46 or 48 or something. So they could out climb us, they could get away from us, they could outrun us. And, and going way up into the atmosphere like that, in just a matter of minutes, your temperature is going to drop 40, 50, 60, 70 degrees. Not in the American airplanes, but in the Russian airplane. The canopy over the guy's head would get foggy. 
and even frost, even frost would occur on the thing. You can't have a foggy, frosty canopy when you're being shot at. So all this is why, for two months, when we didn't have any jet fighters in the arena, they whooped us. Then we took back supremacy when we got our jet fighters there, because even though our jet fighters weren't as heavily armed, weren't uh, given as much gunnery, as much heavy gun, uh, weren't as fast or as powerful, all those things were underneath the Soviets on those, and yet we beat them. Better workmanship, just better all around plane, solved more of our problems, um, better trained pilots probably, uh, even though we were flying, it was a secret at the time, we were flying against Russian pilots flying some of those planes. So what is the lesson we get out of this? Well, <coughs> um, there was a question I'll just mention real quickly about how did the Soviets get the mathematics together for their nuclear bomb? Um, five years before we thought they were going to do it, or two years before we thought they could do it, yet they had done it. And how did they get that together? And the mathematicians who worked on that lived in a very cozy, snug little secluded world with a special store all their own to go to. They didn't have uh, the secret police around them to fear. They didn't have um, any uh, strictures on, on the things they could do or say or censorship or anything. They lived in a secluded bubble of absolute freedom inside Soviet Russia. Frightening that they were willing to do that work knowing they lived in a slave society, but assuming they said, no, I'm not willing to do this work, they wouldn't, they would probably not be free anymore. So uh, that's how they got their mathematics done. Same thing with the space program. Uh, largely, their space program was a disaster, but to the extent that they had, for example, good rockets, it's because they captured so much German technology in World War II. How did America get so many good rockets? We had crappy rockets. Our rockets were crap. Even with uh, Werner von Braun with us, who came from the, the Germans. He is a German. Now, how did the Germans, how did the Nazis come up with rockets then? Because as we said, you have to explain using freedom any accomplishment. And, and you can explain that by saying that the institutionalized, very expensive, massive resources dumped into rocketry and all the testing and stuff over years and years and years in Germany led to some eh, iffy rocket technology, real iffy rocket technology. It's not like they produced great rockets or anything. Uh, and I don't know how soon they would have. And at a so huge expense, the tremendous expense that they went to, um, to, to get the V-2 rockets and stuff to throw at London. Um, that's not hard to explain. It cost them a lot to do not too much. Uh, and they had uh, a measure of freedom, not unlike that of Stalin's, but not as extreme. You have to explain these things. You have to explain how an unfree people can accomplish something. Uh, you don't have to explain how a free people can. That's easy. And we can do more, faster, better, and cheaper than a slave society. What are we going to do about the Muslims? Taking over Western Europe and trying to take over the world and nobody in Europe is trying to stop them. Is it up to us? The thing is, I think it's going to be just like our clash with Germany, Japan, and Russia. Just like the Cold War. It's going to be an American business opportunity. It's going to come at an expense, but it's just going to be something that we do. It'll just be a, a task that we conquer. We can do it, and we will. It'll happen. The Muslims won't win. They. This is going to be a short period of uh, chaos. It should have ended by now already. We've been in Iraq longer than we were in Germany for World War II. It should be over. But uh, it's not. But at some point it's going to be because America is just going to make this into a commercial enterprise. It's just going to become an industrial undertaking for America. There will just be people in America whose job will be this or that aspect of taking care of this or that piece of the war on terror. And we will wage it the way we wage enter any enterprise with the utmost efficiency uh, and it will just be a matter of time before it's done.